Good evening. Hello, everyone. We want to welcome everyone who's here and all of those people who and friends who are watching us out there. Uh, thank you for attending the opening event of the Undesign the Red Line exhibition at Barnard College at our Milstein Center. Yes, it's okay to clap. <laughs> we want to remind you that we are in a space with great technology and the drop ceiling mics throughout the room will share audio from the audience. Please be aware that even your gasps, laughter, whispers of all will be transmitted to our remote audience. We also ask that you remain masked for the duration of the program. This semester, you can find events related to Undesign the Red Line on our website. We currently have a call for proposals for the Undesign Symposium. The symposium will take place November 18th and 19th, and the deadline to submit a proposal is October 5th. We welcome additional opportunities to collaborate with classes and events and consider this, we hope that you will consider this an open invitation uh, to be out to reach out and be in touch um, with how you might like to use the exhibition. At this time, I would like to welcome Miriam Sissoko from our student advisory board to come forward and Mariam is also a student government representative for inclusion initiatives.
Hi. <laughs> Hi everyone, I am speaking from Morningside Heights, which is the ancestral home of the Lenape people who were forcibly removed by settlers. The Lenape people's land spans from New York, parts of, parts of New Jersey and Eastern Pennsylvania where I am from. I acknowledge the ongoing work of Lenape descendants, and other indigenous communities, resilience and resistance in the face of ongoing displacement and colonial expansion. We stand with indigenous communities who are currently fighting to preserve their sovereignty in the face of corporate exploitation. Additionally, I want to pay respect to the enslaved African Americans who built this country off of stolen land and their ancestors who are currently being displaced as a result of Columbia University's ongoing gentrification of the Harlem community. We should all be acknowledging the displacement and disenfranchisement of both in black and indigenous communities as we discuss the impact of redlining as well as be aware of our privilege as American citizens to receive a vaccine that is currently being denied to countries who persevere through colonialism and med now medical imperialism while climate change disproportionately impacts lower income frontline communities. As Bar Barnard enters its year of science, I am proud to say that I am working with peers who, who aim to mitigate the impacts of environmental racism that environmental racism that, as we know from recent event, events, predominantly impacts immigrants of color. Additionally, I want to set, shed light on the ongoing gun violence ec epidemic in Philadelphia, again, where I am from, the resistance and call to change exhibited by the Black community, my community, is admirable. The senseless loss of life over the past few months illustrates how deeply redlining impacts the livelihoods of Black and Brown Americans in every major inner city. To end, I'm proud to be here building solidarity and community with all of you as we work to shed light on the continued inequity perpetuated against marginalized communities. Thank you, Mariam. Now I want to um, welcome Provost Linda Bell. Um, Provost Bell, thank you for all of your support of this project over the past two years. It is not possible without the encouragement that you gave us. So thank you so much. And you can take mic. So um, first, let me just lower this a little bit. Uh, I want to offer a warm welcome to everyone here. And uh, also a big thank you to a list that's too long to mention, except for Miriam Neptune um, by name, who I worked most closely with on the logistics of this project and who we know is just fabulous at what she does in many respects. So um, I also wanna thank uh, all those faculty and staff and students too long to mention whose names I said I wouldn't mention, but, but whose names are in my brain here, who made the project and presentation really what it, what it is. So the project from my perspective couldn't be more timely and more important for several reasons. First and most importantly, in grappling with the issue of redlining and so close to our own neighborhood, it forces an examination of structured inequality and racial inequity and probes with force and with honesty, one of the most significant challenging, persistent and socially damaging policies of the day. Second, it showcases in a meaningful way in which we approach our responsibility to interrogate as an institution, difficult issues such as the racism inherent in systems that are designed to block out. Third, it supports a core concept at Barnard of interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary dialogue and discovery. And with the work of so many Barnard scholars involved, it amplifies our notion as an institution in which excellence requires a diversity of views and expertise at the table. Fourth, it permits a dialogue between the work in our classrooms and the work in our communities and showcases Barnard student research in the form of stories from the line 
and student leadership as advisors and as advocates. And I can't personally can't wait to see the substantive consequences of the student work that's produced as a result of the prompts implicit in this installation. And finally, and in a very Barnard way, it brings a novel approach to what Barnard has called this year, the year of science, broadening the scope of scientific inquiry to include a commitment to addressing issues such as unequal access to healthcare and vulnerability to climate change and insisting that in order to fully comprehend and understand these problems, we must know their roots in a structured context. So again, thank you to everyone involved in this, uh, in the conception and in the curation of this important, and I will add quite beautiful project. With the, panel, with the panels installed and many of the stories as yet untold, the work can in earnest now begin. So uh, thank you for that. I'm gonna turn it over to our new Dean of Blaze, Monica McCormick. Thank you. thank you, Linda, and thank you for giving me the opportunity, Miriam, to welcome everyone. As the new Dean of Blaze, this is my seventh week in the job. It's a particular pleasure to welcome you all and to meet most of you for the first time tonight. So thank you for being here and welcoming me. When I was exploring this position just in the last few months. One of the most intriguing aspects of this job for me was the relationship between the library's excellent collections and staff and services and the academic centers, the programs and people with whom we share this really beautiful building. And I was picturing a whole multitude of ways that we could work together across disciplines in media of all kinds, combining approaches that are analog, digital, empirical, computational, pedagogical, and all supported by our expansive collections and diverse expertise. So for me, the Milstein Center for Teaching and Learning seemed to house the kind of library that I wanted to join, a space where the partners could spark creativity, enable discovery, and generate new knowledge in every possible form and in multiple forms simultaneously. So for me, it's a great thrill to join Barnard at just this moment, at this particular moment in the life of this project. Undesign the Red Line is just a splendid example of exactly what I imagined, what is possible with visionary people and the rich resources of Milstein Center in partnership with faculty, students, alums, and our colleagues in the community. This is exactly the kind of thing that I thought could happen and I arrive and here it is. As I've engaged with the exhibition, browsed the online syllabus, explored the reports of the reading group, I'm really grateful for the splendid example of what can be done in, in a space like this, with resources like this, with people like this. Redlining is an ideal topic for the kind of analysis that can emerge from that kind of complex collaboration. Engaging history, policy, stories of opposition and ongoing struggle, drawing from all kinds of resources, journalism, photography, oral histories, and other archival resources. This project is a powerful example and a result of so much commitment and hard work. So congratulations and thanks to all of you who supported the project, who did the research, who produced the exhibition, the website, the syllabus, and are continuing to engage with all these ideas in the year ahead with the symposium and other events beyond. I really appreciate that you've provided this powerful example of what collaboration, creativity, collections, and commitment can produce. So congratulations. I just turn over to Jennifer Rosales, Executive Director of the Center for Engaged Pedagogy. Thanks for having me. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Jennifer Rosales and I direct Barnard Center for Engaged Pedagogy. I started at Barnard two years ago and about 10 days into my stead, Miriam met with me and said, I have an idea. <laughs> she wanted to bring Undesign the Red Line to Barnard. I said, sounds great not anticipating what was to come. She begins by setting up a meeting with April Desmone from Designing the We, Mary Rocco, Assistant Professor of Urban Studies, and me. 
Between Mary's research and teaching background, Miriam's expertise and experience with designing the Wii and Barnard's own historical context, it was clear that the exhibit would take place on this campus. But what I could not have imagined was the incredible pedagogical collective that was formed under their leadership around this exhibit. While doing the heavy lifting of procuring grants for this work from New York Humanities and Columbia University, Miriam and Mary simultaneously created a collective through multiple forms of engaged pedagogy. They provided an open invitation to faculty, staff, students, community partners across the college to take part in the planning committee. From there, they organized subcommittees on topics like faculty engagement, student engagement, fundraising, community engagement that supported the integration of this exhibit into Barnard's community. They also created a reading group that rotated facilitation of sources depending on interests and expertise. So, for example, environmental professor, environmental science professors, Logan Brenner and Elizabeth Cook led a session on hot cities, redlining, and environmental injustice. And BCRW's Pam Phillips taught us all about the history of public housing in her research project, Changing the Narrative. This reading group laid the groundwork for collective knowledge production and learning necessary to engage in systematic racism and the legacy of redlining. The resources from this group became the basis of a public syllabus designed and operated by the Digital Humanities Center, which now has over 300 videos, articles, podcasts, and student projects. There was also the Housing Stories Lunch Hour for folks to share their own housing stories with one another. This Housing Lunch Hour helped participants connect the structural issues of housing to their own personal experiences. They invited students into the learning community and compensated them for their research and authorship on materials in this exhibition. They worked with the CEP to host an institute for faculty to design the inclusion of the exhibit in their courses. They hosted a charrette for folks to co-design the final panel of the exhibition in order to explore how we might undesign the systems of oppression that stem from redlining together. And while they were creating all these opportunities for folks to engage with the subject matter and one another on the personal and structural levels, they did so in participatory ways that transgressed traditional forms of knowing and creating within institutions of higher education. So on behalf of the Undesigned Planning Committee, I'd like to thank Miriam and Mary for leading such an incredible learning experience for all who have been touched and will be touched by the exhibit. I can now pass the mic to Miriam Neptune, Director of Teaching and Learning at Digital Scholarship, my stunning, brilliant, deeply caring friend and colleague. <laughs> Um, I'm really, really moved um, to be here with all of you. I just wanted to say that um, this work, this incredible work that moved me um, several years ago when I had the chance to meet April De Simone uh, and her team, Charles, thank you for being here, um, has been an inspiration and it has been the guiding um, uh, object, uh, just seeing it in the space is so satisfying. Um, so that's a big reward of all of this work. So I want to also let you know that this event happens in a context. Um, this is the same week that uh, our partners, Bar Barnard Center for Research on Women, are co-sponsoring an international conference called Dismantling Eugenics, which is a transnational anti-commemoration of the second international conference on eugenics, which took place at the American Museum of Natural History in, in 1921. As the organizers of the anti-commemoration explain, eugenics is a pseudoscience that pointed out some human beings, largely white, able-bodied heterosexual men who were considered fit, while others were considered unfit. And this ideology still plagues, plagues our modern society in the form of ableism, classism, homophobia, misogyny, racism, transphobia, xenophobia, and other forms of social tyranny today, in their words. I encourage you to check out that conference, which is ending tomorrow. 
and highlights work of activists who've been part of the Barnard community. In putting up this exhibition on Design the Red Line, we acknowledge how this wonderfully diverse college community in this city at large, um, in the city at, all, at large, we have been all impacted in some way or have unwittingly contributed to, or many of us have benefited from the idea of a hierarchy of human value. We hope that the exhibition on display at Barnard, which is part of Columbia University, one of the biggest portfolios of privately held property in the city and the state, that is part of also a city that faces the multiple crises of un unaffordable housing, a tenuous eviction moratorium, a persistently segregated school system, as well as unequal access to protection from increasing climate disasters, as Tropical Storm Ida recently reminded us. And we, when we bear witness to the crisis of people migrating because the places they call home have been made unlivable. And being met with the violence of border agents with whips on horseback. Those people that I call my uncles, my aunts, my cousins. I hope that this exhibition is a starting place for all of us to consider what values do we want to live with? What do we want to build our institutions and communities from? And how do we refuse systems that rely on a belief in the fitness of some and the unfitness of others in order to profit? As we in the reading group and the planning committee have asked ourselves over and over again, how do we construct something new and better? Um, and my partner in doing that, has been Mary Rocco. I'm going to introduce her. Thank you. It's wonderful to see you all here tonight. Undesign the Red Line at Barnard situates the practice of redlining in the larger histories of violence, displacement, segregation, and extraction that have shaped U.S. cities. It demonstrates the power of the underlying logic of white supremacy to racialize design and development at the block, neighborhood, and city scales. In the timeline, or section three of the exhibit, we see how that logic moved from ad hoc practices to institutionalized forms of discrimination and exclusion in government policy, planning, and private practices. These histories are laid out alongside a mirror timeline that chronicles histories of community organizing and resistance efforts to ameliorate the effect of discriminatory praxis. In section four, stories from the line, members of our planning committee researched and compiled local histories from our surrounding neighborhoods in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx. These stories, along with the collaborative design charrette we held over the summer to imagine new future institutions for neighborhoods, for new futures for institutions, neighborhoods, and cities no longer steeped in designs predicated on white supremacy, illustrate the collectivity and collaboration that serve as a model of community engaged approach to the project's design here at Barnard. And so tonight we gather together in person for the first time, many of us, and also all of you out there. We celebrate the culmination of the past many months of collective learning, teaching, listening, and sharing. The process wouldn't have been possible without the integrated knowledge, experience, and expertise of our planning committee made up of students, faculty, staff, alumni, and community partners. I'd like to recognize and thank our community advisory committee, Shirley Taylor, director of education at, at the Apollo Theater, Ariana Allensworth, artist and co-founder of the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project, Zakia Collier, digital archivist, Schomburg, Research, Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture, and Michael Pardis, Executive Director of the Bronx Cooperative Development Initiative. In addition, we, mel we welcomed members from Local Community Board 9, community researchers and activists through our open reading group. Thank you all for this opportunity to learn with you over these past many months. Now I wanna invite Anique Edwards class of 2025, 2024, let me get it right, um, to come up and read a poem. Thank you. Oh, 
Hi, my name is Anik and I'm from Brooklyn. So this poem is sort of like inspired by a lot of the things that I sort of like witnessed in my neighborhood. So, and it's called My Black Brooklyn Block. My black Brooklyn is unseen. Buried in the east of bed she stands out to me. Converted repurposed brownstones in a slew of new townhomes, her narratives show. Caribbean cultures center the scene. Grenadians, West Indians, united by sea. The brick hardens and shifts as the neighbors get out to mow the lawns of the houses they now own. My black Brooklyn block is old. Antique, she positions herself like gold. Never mind the rats that rummage the sidewalk in hopes of trash. My block is beauty, hidden and truly. The block stands testament to all the efforts that thwart a black existence as we play our part and carry our duty and lift our legs, uplifting the backs of our neighbors' heads. Imagine such a scene, somewhat rare, but something we need. A vision from a past life turned friction into green. By the eyes of struggle and the views of plight, near the stairs of my townhouse, I hear a flicker and see a light. A man stands and he brings me a book, small and blue, it reads, the places we mistook. In it, he tells me my Brooklyn block is quite the look. He says half a mil is all I can do. I smile and I laugh and I say screw off because I'm shook. For what he seeks, he can't obtain. My Brooklyn block is here to stay. As the green leaves the leaves, my thoughts are heavy to my knees. Maybe, just maybe, my parents will sit forth and say, how is my mortgage going to be paid? Half a million birds sing as they flock away. The winter is cold, but love is the Brooklyn way. The neighbors spread warmth as we string along the streets. Ruminations of moving seem obsolete. And now it's December, the, the lawns sulk and the trees lean, the house breathes out a sigh of pity and mutter, oh, woe is me. The concrete flowers tower, they feel change underneath. They come up through the cracks as if to say, don't forget me. The lawn whimpers and the people of the block quiver. Winter comes and alas, our fragile house delivers a cry of sweet timber. Our faces glow and glimmer, despite the vacant lots, we only needed very little to feel a lot. Imagine such a scene, somewhere near and quietly it beams, a projection of a current life turned abstract into real ties. The people of the eye cries and the views of plight stay good and tight. The zones applied are as clear as night. The snow falls down and coats my black Brooklyn block white. My, black, my Brooklyn block has been seen. The streets feel clouded and I see little of others like me. The Jamaican bakeries on Pacific and after school, the students visit. But this winter, something is a little different. The prices have raised and the dough pace thickens. The consistency is off and I see a division. As customers come in, I peep into the kitchen. Inside, I see a brand new cookbook tiled and written, all of the food we mistook. I look back to the door and I see my culture's competition. Strangers stream in demanding the right composition of attitude of food, their demands are cruel. They berate our blocks with ideas backed by fools. Who could only dream of stripping my block of its dues? As winter goes on, the block listens and drools at the thought of a spring where flowers can roll. Springtime comes, yet the block is empty. My black Afro neighbors have seemed to left in a frenzy. Buried in the east of bed my block bends over and dies. As the trees blossom, a sadness fills the sky. In the season of growth, the Afro inhabitants have been left in demise. I ponder how much longer I can call this block mine. A Brooklyn block has been seen. The lines that zone it seem new to me. The stores are coated in white and loaded with testimonies of devotion that fuel its promotion. The Jamaican bakery has shut down and now, and now towers is supposed best bagel place in town. But if you wanted just bagels, why kick us out and stable? The love of my block could be a fable, but there is no block to call mine. My family has moved on and so have I. But every now and then I walk up Fulton and peer into the sky of my beautiful black Brooklyn for those who cannot see my ancestors who claim these properties of land and love. My black Brooklyn block is buried above unseen or seen she awaits her. Thank you, Anik. Um, I forgot my job. Uh, I want to say it's, I hear so many personal experiences in that poem. 
And um, it's what we're asking people to do is to walk through this exhibition and see, see their community, see where they've lived, revisit the experiences that they've had. Um, so thank you for modeling that for us. Um, and we are now gonna show you a quick video that was produced by Barnard's communications team. Uh, Jonathan King was the videographer and we're really grateful. You know, we're really glad to finally install the uh, Undesign the Red Line exhibit here this weekend. This is something that we've been thinking about uh, for a couple of years. Um, you know, it's important we get to hear the research questions of students and students want to know um, answers to really complex questions about how inequity comes about in communities. We're super excited that Undesign the Red Line has been this collective effort to bring to Barnard and the experience. <laughs> you know, we're really glad to finally install the uh, Undesign the Red Line exhibit here this weekend. This is something that we've been thinking about uh, for a couple of years. Um, you know, it's important we get to hear the research questions of students and students want to know um, answers to really complex questions about how inequity comes about in communities. We're super excited that Undesign the Red Line has been this collective effort to bring to Barnard and the experiences that not only students but faculty in the expanded community can have in really understanding and contextualizing the significance, particularly in this year of science. Uh, what's really exciting about this exhibit that might be different from other exhibits is that this is an interactive piece and it really um, works best when people share something back. So we invite people to come in and um, pin a location on the map and leave us a story. And we're gonna try to find ways to document the stories that get left behind. We wanted to really get students and faculty and other members of Barnard staff to help develop kind of content that's personally related to the university, to the neighborhood we're situated, and in this part of Manhattan and even in the Bronx, to understand kind of placing the legacies and the histories that are presented in this exhibit within a specific narrative of how it relates to the school and the students who have come here. Barnard students who are going to sort of be going into a variety of different professions, um, you know, working with digital technologies, environmental uh, services, um, and even city planning, hopefully, will gain a, a greater understanding for the city that they uh, live, work, learn, and play in. I've been living in New York for the past like 13 years since I graduated, and housing is something that every single student is going to have to navigate um, when they graduate. So, you know, trying to find an affordable place to live, being in different neighborhoods, you know, interacting with people, and um, these are really important uh, things to know and context to learn about. We're at a critical moment in cities and I think Barnard students realize that uh, going to school here in New York City. Um, they are concerned about issues of racial justice, they're concerned about climate change, and the legacies of redlining have an impact directly on so many of the issues that we're continuing to grapple with in the city today. call up Mary and April who are going to turn on their mics so we can hear them and I'll move this mic. Before we get to the fireside chat moment, I have been remiss in not thanking someone who has been an integral part to this project. Vanessa Bill, thank you so much.
you have worked tirelessly to bring this into being. And we are so appreciative of all of those hours that were spent on the West Coast, from the East Coast and back. So thank you so much. Right, and now it is my distinct honor to introduce April de Simon. I have to do the whole bio. <laughs> Sorry. April is a transdisciplinary design practitioner with over 20 years of experience. Her work navigates the intersectionality of architecture, planning, and systems thinking to develop contextualized frameworks advancing more equitable, humane, and just representations of spatial authorship. April continues to be an invited lecturer, speaker, and facilitator at numerous institutions. She sits on progressive boards, including the American Sustainable Business Council, and works closely with local and national level with diverse stakeholders within the design sector, like the Urban Design Forum on issues of race, equity, and new economies. A Dean Merritt Scholar recipient, she received her Master's of Science in Design and Urban Ecologies from Parsons School of Design, and is currently pursuing her Master's in Architecture. Welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So I have some questions here and then we're going to open it up uh, to the rest of the audience. Recognizing that many folks here and in our remote viewing audience as well, may not have had a chance to explore the exhibit, have not had a chance to sort of look through the installation just yet. Can you talk a little bit about what motivated you in this work and how you came to, how it came to be? Um, before I start and answer that, I really do want to extend a big smile, hug, love of appreciation to you, Miriam, Vanessa, everyone, all of the students. Um, it has been such a heavy lift to bring this. This is the most engaged um, exhibition we've ever been involved in, and it really created such a substantial exchange and, and humanness to the connectivity of very, very complex language and, and, and subject matter. So I, it, the list, is, it, it's too long to thank everyone, but I just want a heartfelt thank from myself and Charles and Alicia um, and everyone. Thank you all um, for such an incredible job. You can clap for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think um, I, as I shared in our reading group, a lot of the inspiration from this exhibition comes from personally growing up in the Bronx and literally experiencing something um, that we kind of talk about in theoretically the tale of two cities, um, that that's a real thing that people go through and live. And very early on um, navigating through my neighborhoods, through the streets and seeing um, just tremendous neglect to the infrastructure. Um, it's a time where all the buildings are being torched in the Bronx, really began to impose on me why is there this distinction between when I travel here and maybe when I go somewhere else. What is the thinking or the psychology or, or the heart that allows for this and we normalize this to some extent um, and saying that this is okay, particularly in a country that purports life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for we the people. And it really had, um, again, created this imprint and watching what happens um, to people in my community. My father, as I've shared with you all, succumb to the HIV AIDS virus and even watching how that becomes spatialized and who gets treated and how they get treated um, in those spaces. And that just led to a journey where I arrived at um, Parsons School of Design, worked with um, Braden Crooks, Charles, Sabrina Dorsainville, and a whole myriad of people to say, what are the mediums that we use? Because the pedagogy is not there. We have to start activating spaces where we can begin um, capturing these conversations to then tell a story to the entire world. And hence in 2015, launched the exhibition in my hometown, Bronx, New York. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, the exhibition captures the spatialized psychology of inequality and deprivation across both time and place. It illustrates the, how the system was designed to discriminate and exclude. In section five, for those of you who haven't visited yet, you lay, out, you lay out a system systems approach to undesigning these policies and practices. Can you describe that approach and how it informs your own design practice, but also how it can also inform others, non-designers and designers alike? It, it, you know, great question. I, you know, when we look at 
um, the climate we're in, everyone is throwing this word equity around and saying, oh, and we do these land acknowledgements. But sometimes we don't understand how inequity has arrived to a place. It is often a very hidden narrative. And the correlation between spatialized psychologies, like it's not just the fact that we have a redlining map. It's that there is a psychology behind the people who sat at the table and produced a map and began to other so many and use language that was very pariah. So when you see a question in the exhibition, particularly in the area descriptions that produce these maps, ask, what is a detrimental influence? And if you see dot, 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 Negro and whoever else who's not considered worthy, they are actually imposing a, um, a cognitive connection to identity to say, this is something that will create a detrimental value within space. And that gets morphed into so much more. And as was mentioned earlier, we're in um, the anti-commemoration of the, the 100 years of the eugenics um, conference at the Natural Museum. We think that these things have dissipated or they don't exist over time, but it has been so spatialized and entrenched. We know when we walk by a building, who's supposed to be in there and who isn't. Vernacular like low income, middle income or luxury restratifies these hierarchies of human value. And the argument is if we don't, again, um, have the pedagogy and the processes that lead into spatial practice. And when we say spatial practice, as an, you know, with an architecture background and a designer, it's not just exclusive to us. It's all of us are designing the built environment. All of us are creating um, sort of interventions and interrogations into systems that then yield a lived experience by human beings. And if we, as an academic institution and beyond, want to encourage a really different vision of justice and equity and healing and restitution, we have to begin again, identifying the nodes and interrogating like a spatial forensics of what's implicit and invisible that we're not seeing with the work that we're doing. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to open it up to questions um, from the audience. Was there anything unexpected? Um, that you've learned through the years of doing this exhibit? Um, yeah, a lot. <laughs> but I think the one that stands out, um, James Lowen um, recently passed away and he wrote a book um, called Sundown Towns, but he's also the author of the things my, our teacher um, didn't teach us, um, if I got the title correct. And we are often um, very much uh, shown this um, understanding Isabel Wilkerson in The Warmth of Other Sun speaks of the great migration of what happened, you know, people that went um, from the South to the North looking for jobs. I thought what was so interesting was something that he coined the great retreat that happened predominantly in Northern cities and that there were these sundown ordinances that, you know, the South had Jim Crow, they didn't need them. So a lot of them were either official or unofficial that technically said if the sun went down and you were of an ex-ethnicity and you were caught outside, it would lead to a lynching uh, or some act of violence to ensure that you knew your visibility was not there. So that really, uh, you know, it just speaks about the spatialization that we always kind of coin the South and the, 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 the legacy of slavery not understanding that the psychology was expounded all over um, this country. And it really is going to take an understanding and a concerted effort um, to take that work and, and reveal it and say, where were um, sundown ordinances, both again on the record and off the record present? Because it speaks to what he says is the great retreat. When we look at rural communities, right? And we say, oh, black and brown people don't live in these um, rural urban communities. Well, what he was correlating is that they were driven out because of these ordinances. And we know places like, again, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and beyond, there were many of those instances. So it really changed the demographics of who's in those spaces and who gets represented that then yields who gets to vote, who gets to own property, and who gets assimilated into this concept of the Americana. Absolutely. <laughs> I was just thinking about Montana. People don't think about Montana as also having ex uh, suffered that same level of place-based violence, but the histories are there and right. just not well known. That's right. That's right. Other questions? Um, in working on this exhibit, I kind of like started to recognize my own like neighborhood in West Philly. 
and I felt like I had a different emotional reaction to it coming back, mm-hmm. like going back home after working on the exhibit and living in New York. So I was just wondering how have you like changed your perception of where you grew up, or even just walking around like in New York City or in the Bronx or like just anywhere, like having designed this entire exhibit and designed or or put words to something that we all intrinsically. Great, great question. Thank you. I, you know, when I go back to Tremont in the Bronx, where I'm from, there is enormous pain, actually. And the the exhibit is a sedative to kind of channel rage. And because when you start playing back like a Rolodex in your mind, you see just this complete erasure of even the architectural quality um, in Tremont. But you see then what gets put on in in place and the the rebranding of, again, pariah and othering. And there's like there there are so many voices that have gone unheard that this exhibition is an ode to all of them. People who, as I navigate that block, so and so used to live here, so and so um, used to live there and the violence that consumed that community, because it wasn't just on the heels of the uprising. It was uprising that led to the heroin epidemic in the Tremont community, that led to the HIV epidemic in that community, that led to the crack epidemic in that community, that led to unprecedented violence, and now the COVID, right? So when we say that, oh, this is a new thing, there's tremendous hurt to walk through my community to have these memories. And it fuels the work on the other side to ensure that these narratives are embraced by all of you and you splinter off and do the work that needs to be done in your community, like West Philly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'm curious about um, your, the, what you've noticed in the sort of research and design process and um, how that's maybe been distinct from other cities that um, design has traveled to um, and how it's how the community engagement has been. I, like I, it's so it was so substantial here and it really just opened up a new breath of you know potentiality um in other cities and I, I it really taught me just how engaged people are with this material how they want to also share in their stories and and the experience and I think what is amazing is the sense of bringing community um together and that really um stood out here there's always a process in other cities But I think it was so substantial here with just all the different stakeholders and players that it just took it to another level. And I think, you know, it's going to come out in lots of the programming that we're going to see over time. I think we have time for one more question. Um, So I guess one follow up on your point, April, is that Malcolm X said that everything below Canada is just south. And it doesn't mean that Canada doesn't have its own experiences with racism, but I just like to, to remind. That's right. <laughs> That's right. right after we were thinking about the United States. Right. Um, but my question is, uh, I guess you, uh, I think, started to talk about this, but I just was curious if you could amplify a bit more some of the um, key policies that you think have been embedded in the federal, um, state, and local level. So in my class, I often talk about like, our favorite F word is federalism and thinking about how things like the diffusion of authority and various institutions and actors create um, the structure that you keep alluding to the more you expand on what you think are the most critical. And then if you could connect that to this idea of undesigned, like what do you think are the policies that we should be considering for, for reparations and for repair? So if you know we're holding people accountable, what kinds of things should we be holding them accountable for yeah. as yep. we try to move forward? Yeah. Another um, great question. I, I always encourage, and I think you, um, we, we discussed it in one of our reading groups. It was called illiberal reformers and sort of the rise of stati- statisticians and experts as sort of the authority. And what we often leave out in that understanding in this book, A Liberal Reformer by Thomas Leonard, is that they become the authority to then institutionalize and codify these very psychologies of eugenics and this, these hierarchies. And it becomes a stark contradiction, right, of then these concepts of um, these intrinsic and constructive concepts of universal values of democracy, right? So think of y- y- the egregious act of redlining isn't that that was the advent of racism, right? This policy was born out of a thinking of a culture, of a climate, right? That then 
people who are put in positions of authority to steward the ideologies and principles of this concept we're calling democracy are now making decisions that we are dealing with the ramifications and the collateral consequences to this day. So when we understand sort of these structures of policy and the science that fueled them through statistics, here we are in this year of science, right? How science becomes a manipulative tool to then leverage us to go in this direction. What, what does undesign mean? Well, it's changing pedagogy, right? And this, this concept of how we approach, how we learn and how we understand. And how does pedagogy inform different processes of then how it translates into spatial practice? And for you know, a lot of the work that I'm doing now, I, you know, one example that shows that we, we are moving in a direction, we're working, I can't reveal where it's at, but there's the plantation in Louisiana. And we know that plantations are symbols of supremacy in all its form, race, gender, religion. And what I think was so powerful about this project is that we brought so many diverse, a, a very diverse collective together to begin to deconstruct the act of memorializing on a site that has borne these legacies of dehumanization or subhumanization. That process um, was emboldened by a pedagogy that most people didn't understand. It was so profound for the firm that they said, we would like to embold this into our architectural practice, right? And we know that only 0.2% of women of color are licensed architects in this nation, right? 0.2% of um, um, women of color. It was, it was so moving. Who would have thought Louisiana, girl from the Bronx, the head of that firm is Trey Trahan, we came together and they offered me a principal role. And when you say, how do we undesign the optic of having a black woman at the seat of authority of these types of conversations to then inform policy, to then inform how architecture begins to translate these spatial experiences of injustice. These are acts of undesign, right? These are, it's not that we're gonna have a blanket policy, it's reparations to our democracy. And I think they're gonna come in different ways. And I think we're all gonna be able to identify what speaks to us and what our acts are of undesigning. Thank you, April. <laughs> we really, really appreciate all of your wisdom and design. And also thank you to Charles um, for, for bringing this. Thank you. I'm going to re I'm going to bring the mic back. Yep. Yes. Of course I lost my spot. Uh, finally I would like to invite Jasmine Masso to come forward. Jasmine is a visual artist. And writer and currently works in the Barnard Digital Humanities Center as a postback fellow. Uh, this is a poem inspired by Langston Hughes's poems titled Harlem and Restrictive Covenants. Truth is, shrinkage and clearance are rites of passage for neighborhoods swallowed by neglect. Bordered in red and buried deep beneath covenants and contracts and fires and foreclosures and yet. What can bloom in a dream deferred when its roots are tended by the wind, the moon and the sun the cooperatives, the tenants, and the unions, the young lords, the panthers, and the housewives, the children apart, and the keepers of the land. There we find a promise of freedom, of healing, of memory and dreams reborn. Truth is, we are deserving of these rights too. Thank you, Jasmine. You point to 
so much that's in the exhibition. And now this is the time when we invite you to go and hear those stories and to think a little bit about your experience and self tour with the exhibition. And if you're at home and you can't do that yet, we welcome you to come and see us at Barnard um, and uh, to visit the website for more information about visitation as we get closer, hopefully, to being able to invite more people to campus. Um, the website address is undesigned. Actually, you can also access the website from library.barnard.edu. <laughs> easier to remember. Um, Would you like to say anything? I just want to invite folks to go uh, in the exhibit and really engage with it. There's lots of ways in which we have made opportunities available for you to be part of a conversation, to start a conversation, to add or extend a conversation. And we're welcoming all kinds of feedback. So really, if you have a thought or if you think something's missing or you want to add and ensure that it is uh, part of the official record, we plan to archive all of the comments and conversations that are started in those spaces. So please do that um, as you're here at Barnard. And for those of you at home, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we really hope to see you soon.